Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, makers of Lux Flakes, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Pat O'Brien and Lynn Barry in Crack Up. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. As we approach another year, we naturally think in terms of something new and different. And tonight we bring you a special favorite of the screen, Pat O'Brien, in a new and thrilling drama, and for Pat, a very different sort of role. In RKO's psychological mystery, Crack Up, he appears as a man whose temporary mental blindness threatens his entire life turns trust into suspicion, love to doubt. Co-starred with Pat is the talented and beautiful Lynn Barry, who adds a note of romance to this rapid-fire story of murder and conspiracy. Before our curtain rises, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the motion picture studios and the many stars who have provided us with such fine entertainment during 1946. For their cooperation, we extend our heartiest thanks and our sincere good wishes for a happy and successful new year. And I'm sure that if Lux Flakes could speak for themselves, they'd also take this opportunity to wish you all a very happy 1947. Certainly, they'll help to make it happy, as they always have, by lessening your labors and lengthening the life of your nice things. In fact, for those nice things, I'd say Lux Flakes and Happy New Year mean about the same thing. Once again, our curtain rises as we present Act One of Crack Up, starring Pat O'Brien as George Steele and Lynn Barry as Terry Cordell, with Lester Matthews as Traben. <laughs> It's 11 o'clock at night, and in New York's police headquarters, Lieutenant Detective Cochran is on the telephone. Wait a minute, Johnson. Say that over again. Yes, sir. About 20 minutes ago, see? I was just turning the corner at the Manhattan Museum when I see this guy smash the front door and break in. Go on. I go after him, see? He puts up quite a battle, and right in the middle of it, he passes out. Drunk? But good. His name is George Steele, and he's on the staff at a museum. Gives art lectures or something. Who's there with you? I can hear voices. Some of the big shots from the museum. They were having a meeting upstairs when all this happened. I figured I'd better call you, Lieutenant. Okay, Johnson, I'll be right over. Just a second, if you don't mind. How's the patient doing, Johnson? He still keeps mumbling about a train wreck, Lieutenant. Now, let me get this much straight anyway. Mr. Barton, you're the director of the museum? I am, sir. And you're Lowell, and you're Stevenson? That's right, Lieutenant, except it's Dr. Lowell. M.D.? Yes. Uh, Dr. Lowell, Mr. Stevenson, and I were attending a board meeting upstairs. The other trustees left some time ago. We three were still there when this unfortunate incident occurred. You work here, Mr. Stevenson? He's our curator. I see, like Mr. Steele? Mr. Steele's an assistant. He's been lecturing here. I'd suggest that Mr. Steele change his brand of whiskey. I examined Mr. Steele before you arrived. He's more than drunk. He's really ill. There's no denying the odor of alcohol, but I know he doesn't do that kind of drinking. He keeps talking about a train wreck. What could he possibly mean? I'll be able to answer that when headquarters calls me back. I trust nothing of this will get to the newspapers, Lieutenant. It would be most embarrassing. A member of our own staff. Surely you can understand. I'll take it. Hello? Yeah? You're sure now? Did you check every railroad line? Okay, thanks. Come in. Frank. Oh, hello, Terry. Where's George? What's happened? He'll be all right, Terry. He's lying there on the couch. George? Oh, darling. Good evening, gentlemen. What is this? Open house? Who's the girl? Who's this man? The young lady is Terry Cordell. She's a magazine writer, a friend of Mr. Steele's. I phoned her to come. And this lieutenant is Mr. Traben of the English Museum. I was having dinner with Miss Cordell when she got word. Will I be in He's the way? He's talking again, lieutenant. What are you trying to say, dear? What do you mean, were there many killed? The train wreck... It plowed right into us, Terry. That other train. George, this is Lieutenant Cochran of the police department. Uh, police? What do they want? Some answers, Steele, like, where have you been tonight? Was he kidding? What did happen, George? 
I was in a train wreck. That's all I know until I woke up here. And where was the train wreck? Where were you going? North. Same direction the train was going. I was half an hour out of Grand Central with the rest of the passengers. Is, is there something unusual about that? The only thing unusual is there wasn't any wreck. No, 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 no that wreck. phone call I just received, they've checked every railroad. There wasn't any wreck. You're out of your mind. I was in a wreck. What are you driving at? What am I supposed to have done? Among other things, you kicked in the front door here and you struck the police officer who tried to stop you. But let's get back to the wreck that didn't happen. Haven't we had enough cross-examination? Can't now, you see it that won't a... help any of us to get excited. Do you mind if I speak to him? Go ahead, Doctor. Steele, try to remember everything you did today before you took the train. Please, George. Okay. I was here in the museum all day. At 5 o'clock, I delivered my lecture... I have a few definite opinions about art and hypocrisy, and I said exactly what was on my mind. In any event, the people seemed to enjoy it. But when the lecture was over, Mary said... Wait a minute. Um, Who's Mary? Mary Gardner. She's Mr. Barton's secretary. She said Mr. Barton wanted to see me. I'm not at all happy with the nature of your lectures, Mr. Steele. I agree to the series on the basis of your war record and Stevenson's recommendation, but I'm afraid it's not working out. But we're drawing the biggest crowd you ever had. Why, this afternoon... This museum is supported entirely by wealthy patrons, and we cannot afford to antagonize them. The only people who could possibly be antagonized by what I've got to say are the ones who wear culture like a mink coat. People who use this museum on a social front. That such a condition may exist gives you no license to discuss it with the public. And your criticisms of surrealist painting, really, sir, your behavior's been inexcusable. Well, the people don't seem to think so, nor the newspapers. The trustees are meeting here tonight. We'll see what they have to say. Well, in that case, I hope you'll mention the English exhibit. There are a lot of people who'd like to see those paintings, Mr. Barton, besides the friends of the Board of Trustees. The paintings are crated for shipment back to London. To hang them again is unnecessary, expensive, and inconvenient. I will say so at the meeting. I will also say that your suggestion about X-ray equipment is ridiculous. Why? Because this is a museum. We're here to show paintings, not to question their authenticity. The Metropolitan and the Louvre have used X-ray without any complications. I thought it might be interesting to the public if we showed them some of those masterpieces under the X-ray. I will do my best to present your position to the board. All right. And tell them to make up their minds whether this place is to be run like a public institution or a tea party. Good night, Mr. Barton. Well, I left Barton's office, Lieutenant. I came downstairs, met Miss Cordell, and then I... Just a second. Can you verify what he's told us, Mr. Barton? That argument in your office? What he said is true. I resent calling it an argument. Okay, Steele. You met Miss Cordell. Then what? She wasn't alone. Mr. Traben here was with her. I enjoyed your lecture very much, Mr. Steele. Thank you. Say, Terry... Uh, uh, you're Captain Steele, aren't you? I was Captain Steele. Yes, you're the lad who turned up all those forgeries in the Nazi art collection. That was a great job. Thanks. Terry, are you free for dinner? Oh, I'm sorry, George, but Mr. Traven well, and why I... why don't you join us? I'm very anxious to hear more about your work on those forgeries. Some other time. Good night. George! Oh, now, wait a minute. Hey. Well? You're pouting. Come on, what's the beef? There's no beef. Only sometime when you can spare a few minutes, cut me in, will you? George... I'd like a cocktail. It's early. I can tell Mr. Traven to pick me up in an hour. Please. Okay. I'll meet you at the door in five minutes. So we took you out for cocktails, Miss Cordell. Where? Barclays. It's a sort of restaurant. We eat there quite often. But this time you just drank, is that it? Take it easy. We had one drink. We just sat there talking. <laughs> Got a nickel, Terry? Because if you haven't, I have. What do I need a nickel for? Phone call. That's all it'll take to break your date with Traven. I'm tempted, darling. You know, I haven't really seen you for days. I hate to admit it, but I miss you. Excuse me, Mr. Steele. There's a call for you long distance. Long distance? I'll be right back, Terry. Who was it? George. Is anything wrong? It's from the hospital in Glenby. My mother's sick. I, I just have time to make a train. Oh, darling, I'm sorry. I'll go to the station. No, 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 with no. You. you go ahead and have your date with Traven. I love you, Terry. Call me in the morning, darling. Let me know. Can you bring that back? 
Yes, sir. Round trip to Glenby. I'm in kind of a hurry. Yes, sir. That'll be uh... here. Hey, mister. Hey, you change, hey. Good. All good. Hey, Bud, tell him to hold it a minute, will you? My friend here's had a few too many, and I'm... Okay. Okay. You need to hold it for a second, Conductor? That fellow's trying to help us find the train. Oh, sure. Hey, mister, wait a second. I'll give you a hand. So you got on the train to Glenby, Steel. The train you think was wrecked. Yes. See anyone you knew on the train, George? No, Doctor. I I sat down and looked out the window. That fellow with the drunk, they sat down right behind me, and I, I tried to read a newspaper, but I couldn't. I was thinking about my mother. Hoping I'd get there in time. Ladies and gentlemen, I have here a one-pound box of delicious chocolate covered bonbons, shortly going on sale at two dollars a pound. Now I'm giving them away absolutely free as a special advertising offer. Of course, there'll be a slight charge of twenty-five cents for boxing and wrapping. Okay, lady, how many? Just one, please. Yes, ma'am, and thank you. And the gentleman here, how many, mister? Any cigarettes? Maybe you didn't hear me, mister. This trip is candy. All right, I'll get you the next trip. Next trip is coffee, sandwiches, and apples. The next trip is cigarettes. Now, folks, I'm going through this car just once with this special introductory offer. Hey, Doc, Marlin, next stop, Marlin. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Ames? Good evening, conductor. Uh, next stop, Marlin. Marlin, next. I just looked at my watch, Lieutenant, when I saw it coming. There was a curve so I could see it through the window clearly. The headlight of another train cutting through the darkness, brighter and brighter and brighter. It was my imagination. It had to be, but it wasn't. That other train was on our track. I wanted to shout some kind of warning, but I couldn't. I just sat there watching, watching, and then, and then it happened. Everything exploded in front of me. There were screams. That's all I remember until I woke up here. Quite a story. Can you think of some way to prove it? Yes. Where's my coat? Don't bother. You haven't got a ticket, Stubb. We went through all your pockets. Oh, Johnson. Yeah, Lieutenant. Call the hospital in Glenby. Check on a Mrs. Steele. Mrs. Albert Steele. Okay. I don't get it. I just don't get it. George, you've been working pretty hard, you know. Of course I have. I've been overseas, Dr. Lowell. I've got a lot of time to make up. Well, did you have any, uh, well, unusual experiences overseas? Yes. One day I got a V-mail letter I could read. I didn't mean to sound unsympathetic. But it's possible that your war experiences, plus overwork, would be the answer. Lieutenant, what are you going to do? Right now, I'm going to have a smoke. George, tell me. Do you recall ever being in a railroad wreck or having some similar experience when you were a child? Here's a match, Lieutenant. Thanks, Traven. Dr. Lowell's working on him. Yes, you play that quite well inside. I'm much obliged. The museum, Barton, do they really know why you're in New York? I don't think so. Would you mind very much turning steel loose? I can't do that. He's ripe for a psycho ward. He'd be much safer there, but I, I'd rather have him running around for a while. It might help. What's your guess? That he's mixed up in this thing you're working on? That's what I'd like to find out. How? I was wondering if I could borrow a couple of your men to put on his trail. It won't look very good on the records if somebody gets hurt. Well, I'll try and see that nothing happens. Well, uh, let's get back in there. Now, it's just a matter of facing the facts realistically, George. All right, all right. I'm psychopathic. Sure, I was frightened by a train when I was six years old, only I don't remember it. George, please, dear. Did you get the hospital, Johnson? Yes, sir. They got a lot of patients, but no one named Mrs. Steele. I thought so. Go on, then. Lock me up. Mr. Barton... You willing to forget the damages to your front door? Please, my only concern, Lieutenant, is to avoid publicity. How about you, Dr. Lowe? How do you feel about it? When a friend's ill, you want to help him, not punish him. Okay. I'm probably making a mistake, Steele, but I'm letting you go. I'll lay off that vino. And don't take any more train rides or you're liable to wind up in Bellevue. Here's your coat, George. Better put it on. Thanks. Mr. Barton, I'm sorry about this. I can't understand, but I'll make up for it. From now on, my lectures will be conservative and dull. The board has already tentatively considered cancelling your lectures. I think, under the circumstances, we'd better make the decision final. I see. Let's get you home, George. You need to rest. Sure. I'll find a cab, Miss Cordell. Good night, gentlemen, and thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thanks. 
George, how can you just stand here smiling? Well, look, your whole apartment's been wrecked. Furniture, papers. <laughs> Have a chair, Mr. Traven. Just pick anyone off the floor that you like. George. Maybe I wrecked the place. Sure, maybe I did it. Well... If I can dream up train wrecks, why not this? Except you didn't. I couldn't have. The police, probably. One of Cochrane's men while he was with us at the museum. Routine checkup. Somebody should have dropped one of Cochrane's men on Nagasaki. Would have accomplished the same thing much cheaper. Cops mean well. They're just notoriously untidy. It's strange, but you Americans are always fighting an undeclared war against your police. Your cops are only human. They might respond to a little respect and affection. George, these papers They're here... part of my file on the German forgeries. I wonder why they'd interest the police... Well, I hope you'll feel better after a little rest. Good night, Mr. Steele. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Yes, I will. You coming, Miss Cordell? Later. I... I want to talk to George. Thanks for being such a help. Well, that's all right. Good night. Terry, what do you think? What is happening? All of a sudden, I don't know myself. Everything has become unfamiliar. It'll clear up. Oh, I've quarreled with you a lot since I've been back home, haven't I? You've been normally jealous. I've seen a lot of good guys crack up in this war. Cool, composed cookies one day and the next snap like a tight violin string. It was the one fear everybody had. You kept thinking it might happen to me. There's nothing wrong with your mind, so stop it. Your ego's a little bruised because for once you don't know all the answers. But there's nothing wrong with your mind. I still don't know whether I've been in a train wreck or not. I've got to find out. All right, do handstands. Knock your head against the wall. Show your muscles. Do anything you like. What's wrong, darling? What's going on? I'm sorry. I'm mad, I guess. Confused. A little scared. Last night in Barclays, for the first time in three years, I began to sense what life could be like again. You and I, and then... Oh, I don't know what happened any more than you do, darling. I don't really care. I just resent it. How was the dinner with Traven? Did you have any fun? No. George, I... I'm going home. Will I see you tomorrow? Oh, I hope so. How about Barclay at 6 o'clock? 6 will be fine. Now, come here, you big lug, and kiss me goodnight. We're supposed to be engaged, remember? Yeah, I remember, darling. Don't worry, Terry. I'll get to the bottom of this and soon, too. <laughs> have you been all day? Hello, Terry. Sit down. I called your apartment. I called the museum. I... Oh, darling, what's the matter? You wouldn't be working with Cochran, would you, Terry? Oh, don't be silly. He could have told you where I've been. You see that fellow at the bar? The one in the raincoat, I mean. He's been on my trail all day. Follows me everywhere. And I mean everywhere. George, don't. Whatever you're going to do, don't. I've got to find out what happened last night. How can you? Where would you begin? Well, for one thing, if I could lose that Joe, I could get on the same train. Keep my eyes open. I've got to find somebody or something to tip me off as to what went on. Just leave it alone. What would that accomplish? Excuse me, Terry. I'll be right back. Say, waiter, come here, will you? Yes, Mr. Steele. There's a fellow over there at the end of the bar. You see him? He just got up. Tell him Lieutenant Cochran wants him on the phone. Oh, well, wait a minute. Here. This is for you. Oh, thanks, Mr. Steele. I'll tell him. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. Where'd that man go? The one you were just talking to? Uh, the washroom, sir. Oh, you wanted on the phone, <laughs> Lieutenant Cochran, sir. How'd you know who I am? The man on the phone. He said you'd be wearing a gray raincoat. Okay, thanks. Hello? 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 Hello, Cochran. This is Detective Waters, Lieutenant. Sorry, sir, but your boyfriend's shaking me. Where are you, Waters? At Barclays. Steele rigged up a phony telephone call. When I went in the booth, he slipped out through the washroom window. That's a tough break. He's got something on his mind, Waters. And whatever it is, he wants to do it alone. Don't worry. We'll be hearing from Steele again. <laughs> Two of Crack Up, starring Pat O'Brien and Lynn Barry, will follow in a moment. Why that satisfied look, Libby? I was just thinking what a wonderful year it's been here in Hollywood for the many actors who served in the armed forces, who came back and found a welcome from producers and public. Like Tyrone Power, lately of the U.S. Marines? Yes, he's one. 
You know, Daryl Zanuck thought Tyrone was so right for the part of Larry Daryl in The Razor's Edge that he held that production at 20th Century Fox for eight months until Tyrone got out of the Marines. Knowing Somerset Mom's book, I'd say power was just about perfect for the part of the idealistic hero. Who, believe it or not, spurns the love of his fiancée, Jean Tierney. Imagine, and she's so beautiful in The Razor's Edge. Her clothes were simply gorgeous. 20th Century Fox outdid themselves. I didn't know gorgeous fabrics were plentiful these days. They're not, but the studio improvised like wizards. For instance, they made a lace gown out of lace tablecloths. They couldn't improvise stockings, though, could they, Libby? No, but you don't need many stockings when they get Lux Care, as they do at the Hollywood studios. Well, that holds true for girls everywhere, Libby. Because with Lux, stockings last so much longer. When I see girls using a strong soap for stockings, it really hurts me. Why, they're practically cutting the wear in half. That's right, Libby. And you know, I was thinking of all the girls who got stockings for Christmas. I hope they'll remember what our strain tests proved, that stockings washed with Lux flakes lasted twice as long as those washed with a strong soap. That's just like getting an extra pair with every new pair. So be kind to those new stockings, won't you, ladies? And Lux them after every wearing. Here's your producer, William Keeley. We continue with Act Two of Crack Up, starring Pat O'Brien as George Steele and Lynn Barry as Terry. <laughs> Convinced that he was involved in a train wreck, George Steele tries desperately now to retrace his steps of the night before. Again in Grand Central Station, he hopes to find his first clue at the ticket window. Next, please. Round trip to Glenby. Glenby? Yes, sir. Say, were you on duty last night? Yes. In the same window? Well, I don't know, mister. We switch around. I bought a ticket here last night. I left some change. I wondered if you might have remembered me. Say, buddy, I got a train to catch. I see hundreds of faces every day, mister. I can't remember them all. Okay, thank you. What is this, a game? Give me a round trip to Harvard. Cigarettes, candy. I got cigar, folks. I got cigarettes and candy. I'm pasting through the car just once. Say, a uh, fellow. Uh, yes, sir. Cigarettes. What kind? What kind did I get last night? Are you kidding, Joe? What do you think? I keep books? You don't remember? Get this guy. You want I should remember what kind of butts you smoke? It is important. Please, try to remember. What a character. Cigars, cigarettes, candy. Marlon, next stop. Marlon. Conductor. Yes, sir. Do you recall seeing me on this train last night? I I sat right here, in the same seat. Oh, sorry, mister. I can remember a name, but I can never remember a face. Marlon, next. Marlon. They don't remember. None of them. But I remember. I looked out the window and I saw it coming. There was a curve in the roadbed. And I saw it coming toward... It's there again. The headlight, straight for us like a shell out of a gun. We're going to crash. We're going to crash. We're going to crash. Marlon. Marlon's the next stop. Marlon. Marlon. Yes. That's the place. I'll get off. I'll get off at Marlon. Officers closed, mister. Sorry. No, I didn't want a ticket. Are you the station master? Sure am. Do you remember if anyone got off the train here last night? What train? Same train I just got off. Well, now I don't here. know. Here's five bucks. Will that help your memory? Now, that's a funny thing. What? You a private detective? You checking on Mrs. Anderson's husband? Anderson? Mrs. Anderson give me five dollars, too. Just to tell her if he gets off the train with a certain party. Well, did he? Did anyone get off? Yeah, but not Mr. Anderson. A couple of fellas got off. They was carrying another fella so full of liquor he couldn't even walk. Look at me. Could I have been the man they were carrying? Could I? Didn't notice, mister. Sorry. Where'd they take me? Where'd they take this man? Put him in a car. What kind of a car? Mister, I ain't been able to tell one kind of a car from another since 1924. Anything else I can uh, tell you? No, no, not now. Thanks. Thanks very much. Hello? Mr. Stevenson? Yes? Frank, this is George. George, where are you? On the way to see you, if I can. Anyone with you in your apartment? No, come on up. Things are starting to make sense, Frank. I need your help. I'll be there in ten minutes. I'm sure of it, Frank. I'm sure of it. 
I was on that train last night, and the drunk behind me was a plant. Go on. Well, I was slugged. Hit on the head when that other train rushed by. Then they took me off at Marlin. It looked, well, just like two fellas helping a drunk. Oh, but why would anybody want to... Discredit me! Make it look like I was a dipso or crazy or both. I'm in somebody's way, Frank. And it connects with the museum. But how do you account for swearing you were in a train wreck? Or for trying to break into the museum last night and still not know well, about it? Well, yes. I, I don't know yet. Look, something's going on at the museum. You know. I want you to tell me. Okay. This is strictly confidential, George. You remember that painting by Gainsborough we had in the museum? The one that was lost at sea in an explosion? Yes, of course I do. Well, Barton got a letter from a friend of his in London named Montague, telling him that it was not an accident. Not an accident? That's all I know. Barton's been suspecting everybody ever since. Frank, you've got to get me into the museum tonight. Tonight? But why? To check the files. You have a key. I've got to find out if anybody connected with the museum has a house in Marlin. Oh, you can't risk going near the museum. The police are... Oh, yes. I guess maybe you're right. I'll go. You wait here. I'll get your information and call you within the hour. Hello? I've got to talk fast, George. I'm at the museum. Barton was here when I arrived. We had a serious run-in. Can't tell you now, but you've got to get down here and help me check something. It's important. How will I get in and not be seen? I'll leave the basement door open. You'll have to hop over the back wall. I'll be waiting at the vault. That you, George? Over here by the vault. Careful. I don't dare turn on the light till we can close the door. I found something, George. These paintings were sending back to England. Someone's been trying to open the crates. I think... Are you? Hello? Hello, George? Is that you? Darling, where are you? Terry. Frank, Frank Stevenson's dead. Murdered at the museum. Oh, no. I've got to see you. Do you remember that Penny Arcade on 6th Avenue? How soon could you get over there? Tw 20 minutes. I'll meet you there. I'm sorry, darling. I can't tell you anything more unless I see you. Stand next to me, Terry. I'll keep playing this pinball machine. I don't dare look up until I have to. There's a policeman out front. Yes, I know. This isn't going to make sense, Terry. But I'll tell you what I know. That train last night, I was slugged. Who did it? Where they took me? I, I can't answer that yet. Tonight, Frank Stevenson went to the museum to find something for me. I was going to meet him there. I met him all right. He was dead. The watchman must have spotted me. Before I could leave, the police rushed in. I got away, phoned you, and here I am. The police aren't wasting any time. I had the radio on in my car on the way here. Your description's bouncing out of every loudspeaker in town. I'll keep out of their way. Darling, you can't dodge the police forever. Go to Cochrane. Get this out in the open. Oh, no, fine. That's about as smart as slitting my own throat to get some fresh air. But you didn't kill Stevenson. Surely you can prove that. Yes, I can. But not if I'm behind a lot of iron grill work. I've got a lot of things to do, and I've got to be free to do them. Terry, what do you know about that Gainsborough painting that was lost at sea? Only what I read in the papers. It was destroyed in an accidental explosion, and the insurance company paid off. It wasn't an accidental explosion. How do you know? Stevenson told me. And I know that's why he wanted me to meet him at the museum. He must have run into something. Because he did, he was killed. For an art expert, Mr. Steele, you pay a whale of a game of pinball... Traben! I... I phoned Mr. Traben, George. I told him I was meeting you here. Oh, that's swell, Terry. Did you send for Cochran, too? George, you can't handle this alone. Mm, she's quite right, you know. You need help. Suppose you tell me how all this concerns you. I'll tell you what I can at the moment. The only reason you weren't arrested last night after you broke into the museum was because I was able to intervene with Cochran. Huh. My fairy godfather. Why? I'll get to that. You're in pretty deep now. A man's been murdered. Your life is in danger, too. You haven't answered my question. You have some information I need. And I know a number of things of great interest to you. Let's get Cochran and put the pieces together. Hmm. I thought I'd see the hook eventually. Darling, please be reasonable. Why, oh, I'm overwhelmed. Everybody has my interest at heart. Everybody wants to take me to the cops. No, we're only asking you to come. Well, I'd like to think it over. 
You know, it isn't every day that a man can be booked as a psychopathic killer. George, you've got to trust us. I'm not trusting anybody this week. For Terry's sake and the sake of your own safety, I'm afraid I must insist. There's a police officer just outside. Oh. Okay. You win, Trayman. I'll... Oh! George! He's a sucker for a right in the solar plexus. So long, baby. That man, what happened? Somebody fainted. You better get some water. Good evening, Mr. Biden. Now, look here, Steele. Sorry to drag you down here this time of night, but we couldn't very well discuss it on the telephone. Your audacity, ordering me to meet you here at the waterfront. And why did you come? You're wanted for murder. I should have notified Lieutenant Cochran. But we both know why you didn't. Cochran's liable to ask you some embarrassing questions, Mr. Barton. I think I mentioned that when I phoned you. He might want to know what you were doing at the museum when Frank Stevenson was killed. I was going through my papers. I've had some personal things on my mind. I've been very upset. Because of that Gainsborough? Yes. Well, first of all, Mr. Barton, the Gainsborough destroyed at sea by an accidental explosion was not the original. It was a forgery. What? what? Now, it's your turn to tell me something. Your friend in London, Mr. Montague, did he tell you how they discovered the forgery? They... They examined some of the pieces of canvas found after the explosion. The uh, pigment, it, uh, it was obviously not the original. Hmm. That must have been quite a blow to someone. Someone who has the original in his possession now. Someone who had the forgery painted and then arranged for its destruction. Who was it, Mr. Barton? I don't know. Stevenson had found something when he was killed. How do you know? Because he had opened some of the packing cases in the vault. There's been another forgery, Mr. Barton. One of those paintings you're shipping back to England. Don't you think I'd know that? Why do you think I pleaded with Stevenson to let matters alone? I'm supposed to be an expert at spotting forgery. I don't want it exposed. Hasn't there been enough tragedy, enough scandal? Whatever painting it is, and whoever wants it, let him have it. Don't you realize my whole career is at stake? So is my life! It's my guess they'll try the same trick they pulled with the Gainsborough. Another accident of some kind. Well, I've got to spot that forgery before it leaves this country. That means you've got to get me into the museum tomorrow night. I refuse, definitely. It's too dangerous. Since when are you so interested in my health? Uh, besides, I can't possibly be at the museum tomorrow night. I'm giving a reception for Mr. Trapin in my apartment. Oh, yes. I heard something about that. Well, you're going to have two more guests. What are you talking I about? I want Miss Cordell there. Trapin will be very happy to take her. She may learn something. I'll be the second guest. Are you insane? With your help, I should be able to find a nice, cozy spot on the fire escape. Maybe I'll learn something, too. And what if you're discovered? Oh, that would be a pity. But I know you won't turn me in, Mr. Barton. You've withheld too much information from the police. Be at my apartment early. I'll... I'll do what I can. Barton, I've been trying to get you alone all evening. I'm sorry, Dr. Lowell. I'm, uh, I'm always at a loss when it comes to playing host. Well, Stevenson's death has upset you. It's upset all of us. I would have canceled the reception, of course, except Mr. Trabin sailing next week. By the week. way, any news of the fugitive, George Steele? There's no news. I'm sure you would have heard as soon as I. You're much too nervous, man. You'd better stop by my office tomorrow. I'll give you a prescription. <laughs> Some champagne, Terry? Thanks, Mr. Traven. Well, here's luck. It seems so, so cruel. Sipping champagne and not knowing where George is or what happened to him. Well, Cochran has his best men at key spots all over the city. They won't let him get into too much trouble, so I repeat, here's luck. Oh, I beg your pardon, Mr. Trevor. Yes? There's a telephone call for you, sir. You can take it right here on the extension. Thank you. Yes? What? You're sure that's the painting? But it wasn't to be shipped until next week. What vessel? Yes? Yes? What time does she sail? Right. SS Arcadia, Pier 31, North River. Thanks. Terry, do you suppose you could take me for a fast drive? Now? What's happened? Come with me while I find Mr. Barton. What was that you said, Mr. Trabin? Excuse me, I'd better close the door. I said, by whose orders is the Adoration of the Kings being shipped out tonight? Tonight? Mr. Barton, it's my job to see that the collection of English paintings on loan to your museum are returned safely to England. The Adoration of the Kings was to leave next week aboard the Regency. Of course. But I've just had word it's been taken aboard the Arcadia, sailing at one o'clock tonight. Why were the arrangements changed? Nothing's been changed. The painting is still in the museum. It better be. Call the museum at once, please. And tell the watchman that I'm coming right over with Miss Cordell. Steel. So, the Adoration's leaving tonight, Barton. You heard, Trayvon? 
Yeah. I swear I know nothing about it. He must be mistaken. And I must be nuts, because I think you're telling the truth. Miss Cordell's driving him to the museum? Yes. They're wasting their time. Where are you going? To the SS Arcadia, Pier 31, North River. <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We'll continue with Act Three of Crack Up, starring Pat O'Brien and Lynn Barry in a moment. Our special guest tonight is one of those rarities in moviedom, a rising young actress who was actually born in Hollywood, Jacqueline White. How did RKO discover you, Jacqueline? The talent scout saw me a class play, Mr. Keeley. Had you thought of a movie career before? <laughs> Practically all my life. I was so happy to sign with RKO. Have you seen Frank Capra's latest for your studio, It's a Wonderful Life? Oh, indeed I have. You know, Jimmy Stewart chose that for his first picture after five years in the armed services. His fans are giving him and Donna Reed a warm reception. Oh, and I had a wonderful time exploring the sets for that picture, Mr. Keeley. You know, they reproduced the whole town of Bedford Falls where the stories laid. And then I saw the colorful Arabian night sets RKO made for Sinbad the Sailor. Quite a contrast, weren't they? Oh, yes. I walked all over that enormous ship with a big high deck. You know, Douglas Fairbanks can put his commando training to good use in that picture. Marina Harrow's costumes are gorgeous, too. But for every day, I'll take my own simple ones. Yes, why? Well, for one thing, they're so easy to lux. As a matter of fact, Miss White, RKO luxes more things than you dream possible. Anything safe in water alone. From beruffled costume petticoats to smartly simple... 20th century slips. All I know is that mine look lovely after they're luxed. I'm glad to hear you say that, Miss White, because that's just what our tests prove. You see, lots of women told us that they luxed their lingerie time after time, but they wondered how much longer Lux Care helped it keep that nice new look. So a well-known laboratory made some tests for us. On actual slips? Yes. Lace-trimmed and tailored ones. Nighties, too. They found that under things washed the wrong way soon looked faded and drab. But those washed the Lux way stayed color fresh and lovely three times as long. Oh, that's a big difference. It is. So you can just imagine what women all over America save or what studios save with Lux Care. I'm making a New Year's resolution, resolution to use Lux Flakes for every single thing that's washable. A mighty good suggestion for the ladies in our audience. Thank you for coming tonight, Miss White. Here is Mr. Keeley at the microphone. After the final curtain, our stars will join us for a brief chat. And I hope you'll join us, too. Here's Act Three of Crack Up, starring Pat O'Brien as George and Lynn Barry as Terry. At Pier 31, North River, the steamship Arcadia is making ready to weigh anchor. Through the crowd of passengers and well-wishers that line the deck, a figure emerges from the hold, loses itself in the throng, and slips out of sight in the shadows of the wharf. Well, Lieutenant Cochran, there goes Mr. Steele. Yeah, with the adoration of the kings under his coat, he's got that painting trading. Undoubtedly, the painting was not at the museum. It must have been on board the ship. Steele found it. And you're letting him walk off the dock with it. Steele's not the man we're after. I'm getting a little tired of hearing that. I'm using Steele as bait. I have to. If we're ever going to learn who's behind all this. What about that girl, Miss Cordell? She's at the end of the dock. She's waiting in her car. For you or for George Steele? <laughs> You're beginning to catch on, Lieutenant. Oh, I trust your men will be trailing him. I'd really hate to see Steele get into any more trouble. George! Terry! Come on, get in the car. It's better than the subway. Except I can trust the subway. I used to think you worked on a magazine, Terry. What's your real racket? What do you do for a living? I drive around in cars picking up psychopathic killers. Oh, sometimes you make me so... I was at a party at Barton's. All of a sudden, things started to happen. I drove Traven to the museum and then down here. Yeah, I know, and I spotted him on the ship, Cochran, too. Did they see you? I think I'd be here if they did. Look, as far as I'm concerned, we can sit here in the car all night unless you have some dim idea of what you're doing and want me to help you. All right, let's get out of here. Terry? 
is Trayman? An art expert. I know that. From the British Museum. No, from Scotland Yard. He was sent here to check on the missing Gainsborough. I... Oh, I, uh... I've got something here under my coat. So I noticed. Except I'm not supposed to ask questions, it's am I? It's a canvas. A canvas, and I just stole it. It's supposed to be Durr's The Adoration of the Kings. I think it's a phony. How did you get it? Oh, our friend Trabin isn't as nimble as you think he is. I got aboard the Arcadia, went down on the hold, and found a room marked bonded cargo. And nobody stopped you? One guy tried to, a sailor. At least he was dressed like a sailor. He was in the hold playing with matches. I put him out first, and then the fire. George. Yes, the same thing all over again, except that the Gainsborough was an explosion. This time they were trying arson. That sailor. What would you want me to do? Take him to Trabin? I had to leave him there. I'm wanted for murder, and I've just stolen the painting. You know, it's a funny thing. That night on the train, the fellow with the drunk, I could almost swear he and the sailor are one and the same guy. I'm driving uptown. Is that okay with you? Yes. This painting, I, I've got to get it x-rayed tonight. Make sure it's a phony. There's no laboratory open this time of night. Well, I've got an idea. I'm phoning Mary. Mary? Uh, Barton's secretary. Yeah, she's just a kid, but she's all right, and I know she's got a girlfriend who works in the Contemporary Institute. They've got all kinds of x-ray equipment. Come on, let's find a telephone. Where'd she go, Mary, your friend? Well, Dorothy thought she'd better wait in the corridor, Mr. Steele. She's terribly worried. She had no right to let us in here, you know, and using the laboratory... Well, I'll tell Dorothy she can stop worrying. I'm about finished. George. Well, I've x-rayed the canvas. You take a look, Terry. Here, I'll put the x-ray into the machine. Well, what do you see? I... I don't know. What am I supposed to see? What you're supposed to see, what you do see is a forgery of the adoration of the kings. The painting I brought here tonight is the Scola copy. Scola was one of the cleverest forgers in the 18th century. Fine artist, but not as good as Durer. But how can you tell this isn't Durer's painting? Well, the real adoration of the kings has been x-rayed before. When Durer painted it, he used an old canvas, a canvas on which he had once started to paint something else, a landscape. Now, if this were the genuine adoration, you'd see plenty of evidence of the landscape in this x-ray plate. But, Mr. Steele... Yes, Mary? It... If that's true, then the painting we had at the museum was... Was a phony. Sure, this is it, the Scola copy. Well, I'll, I'll tell Dorothy you're finished. I'll need a couple of minutes to clean up. George, finding this out, does this clear you? No, but with what I know now, I can take my chances. You were expecting a forgery. Yes. Frank Stevenson's death gave me that lead. You mean just knowing was enough to get him killed? Plenty. Who's ever engineering this isn't kidding. But they already had the original. This forgery was bound to be discovered. No, no, not if it were destroyed. No one would suspect it was a forgery. And even if they did, how could they prove it from a pile of ashes? Well, I better put in a call for Cochran. Mr. Steele, Dorothy heard someone upstairs. It may be the watchman. Can't we go now? Well, already. Let's go, Terry. Dorothy says we'll have to go out the same way, the back way through the park. I hope Dorothy found a taxi. I don't know why she wouldn't let us drive her home. Oh, you mustn't be offended, either of you, but the sooner she can forget having seen you tonight, the better. Well, at least we can take you home, Mary. What would be the quickest way to... Wait a minute. I, I heard someone. Right there, back of those bushes. Walk ahead with Mary. Please I'll... don't move. Either of you. Mary! Yes, I'm talking to you, Miss Cordell and Mr. Steele. I've got a gun. And if necessary, I'll use it. This way, Dr. Lowell. Hurry, please. In here, Miss Cordell, if you don't mind. Where's George, Dr. Lowell? What have you done to him? There on the sofa. I'm sorry, but it was necessary to render him unconscious. What place is this? My home, just outside of Marlin. I'm not at all happy to find you involved in this, Miss Cordell. But we'll just have to make the best of it. Uh, Mary. Yes? Uh, keep that revolver handy, please. Miss Cordell, I sincerely hope you and George will cooperate with me. By doing what? I have only one simple question for you to answer. Who else knows the Scola copy was substituted for the original The Adoration of the Kings? If I tell you, then what? You might as well tell me. I have a very valuable Gainsborough and a very valuable juror in my possession. I intend to keep them. A fact which Stevenson's death should have impressed upon you. Who else knows? George mentioned a sailor on the Arcadia. Oh, yes, yes. One of my employees, as is Mary here. That 
sailor is now standing guard outside. Well? All right. The police know. George phoned Cochran as soon as he found out. George couldn't have known himself until he x-rayed the forgery. And Mary was with you all the time. He didn't call anybody. She's lying. Why not ask Mary if she left the lab while George was working? Did you, Mary? Yes, I had to. I had to call you. Of course you did. She left another time to talk to her friend. I know she's lying, Doctor. Then we just have to find out the truth from George. I'm preparing a hypodermic needle, Miss Cordell. This uh, drug is called narcosynthesis, something quite new. Discovered during the war. One small injection and the brain is illuminated with accuracy. It also acts as an hypnotic. Oh. Ah, you're doing fine, George, just fine. Oh. Have you up and around in the morning? Oh. I'm going to give you a little injection now. It won't hurt. There we are. Now, George, count with me. One. One. Two. Two. Three. Three. Four. Four. George, can you hear me, George? Yes. You're in the laboratory now. You've x-rayed the painting. What are you going to do? Telephone Cochran. No. No, I can't. Why not? Mary. She just came in the door. Don't you trust Mary? She's a nice kid. I don't want to involve her. I'd better wait. I'm sleepy. Yes, yes, that's it, George. You rest for a while. Well, Miss Cordell, George called your bluff. He didn't telephone. What are you going to do with him? I must dispose of you both. You can't understand how much these paintings mean to me, can you? Uh, museums have a habit of wasting great art on fools who can't differentiate between trash and these masterpieces that mean everything to me. My method harmed no one. But now it's menaced. It was threatened when George first came to the Manhattan Museum. He alone of the staff was an expert on recognizing forgeries. Hmm. What time is it? It used to be that you could set your watch by the trains that pass here. Our schedules are more uncertain these days. You'll forgive my waiting, though. Gunshots at this time of night. Well, I wouldn't like to wake my neighbors. However, they're used to the roar of the Chicago train. Ah, yes. That gun, Mary. Thank you. Please. You must know you'll be discovered. Sooner or later Sooner you'll Sooner or later we all must die. Mr. Traven! I'm sorry, Terry. We had to do it this way. Cochran, take care of Mary. Sit down, sweetheart. George! George! He'll be all right in a moment when the injection wears off. But I'm afraid he'll think he's been in another train wreck. Was this where they brought him the first time? Yes. Lowell drugged him that time, too. Under the hypnotic, it wasn't hard to convince George that he'd been in a train wreck. The trains roaring by here helped the illusion. A devilishly brilliant plot to make George seem insane. Well, Mary, anything to say? We want those paintings, the original Gainsborough and the original Dürer. If you don't help us, we'll see that you're tried as an accessory to Stevenson's murder. Come on, sister, you heard him. There. That picture over the mantel. What are you trying to pull? Even I know that's not a Gainsborough. Well, help me get it down, Cochran. Take care of the dame, Wilson. Yes, sir. This way, miss. It's a heavy frame. Better take it slowly. How long have you been here? Oh, uh, 15 minutes. All the time this was going on? Easy now, Cochran. What's the mantle? The lieutenant here was right behind you, Terry. I was detained a little, taking care of that sailor outside. Well, why didn't you stop, Lowell? I was under the impression that I had. Oh, no, I mean before you could have. Yes, I could have, but I didn't have the paintings. I waited until the last possible moment for Lowell to reveal them. He didn't. But I couldn't let him shoot both of you, could I? 
Hence our melodramatic entrance. There you are, Cochrane. Hidden in the back of the frame. Number one, the Gainsborough. You knew from the beginning that there was a forgery in the museum? That the Dura had been switched in the vault? Yes, I knew. <gasps> Number two, the adoration of the kings. No doubt about it, those boys could paint. Well, you might have told me. I was supposed to have been helping you. You've been a great help, Terry. But the forgery is one thing I couldn't tell you. It's obvious from ten paces that you're in love with George, and I, I couldn't take the risk of your telling him. Had he known, he might have stopped running about and working on the mystery. And Mr. Barton, he knew nothing about it? If you mean Lowell, no. Barton's been just an unhappy old gentleman, trying desperately to avoid a scandal. The train. We're going to crash. We're going to crash. This is where I came in, remember? It's all right, darling. It's all right. Terry! Well, what place is this? What's been... Traben. Cochran. Now, don't tell me you've been in another train wreck. Yes, yes, I have. What do you want to make out of it? When I say I've been somewhere, I've been somewhere, and this time I can prove it. Terry was with me, weren't you? Yes, dear, we were in a train wreck, a big one, enormous. There, you see? No, no, you weren't with me. No, of course not, darling. I was here all the time. Everybody's nuts around this place but me. Well, I... I won't deny I'm slightly dizzy about you. What? She should make a wonderful wife, Steele. No, no, wait a minute. Enough's happened I don't know about. Don't tell me we got married. Why, darling, that's the sweetest proposal I've ever heard. Well, I give up. Come on, honey. As long as I need a keeper, you've got the job for life. Before our stars return for their curtain calls, let's see what happened at the Browns tonight. It's their wedding anniversary. Come on, Mom, open her up. <laughs> Gosh, nothing but a box of Lux. Nothing but? You don't know how lucky you are when you get Lux these days. And I'll be doing a lot of dishwashing during this week with the holiday, Johnny. Well, I still think that's an awful kind of funny kind of a present. <laughs> Go on to bed, you scalawags. This is your mother's night. <laughs> Well, good night. Good night. It was a strange present, John. I was thinking of all the dishes your hands had washed. Oh, I don't quite see. Well, perhaps I'm just being sentimental, but do you remember a very special evening 14 years ago? <laughs> yes, John. You apologized for not giving me an engagement ring. I couldn't afford one that was good enough for your pretty hands. Oh, silly. I wanted to wait until I could give you a really beautiful one. And so, close your eyes. Oh, John. Oh, John, it's too gorgeous. You shouldn't have. Yes, scores of women wash dishes every day, yet their hands never show it because they use gentle Lux flakes in the dishpan. If you've let your hands get rough and red, change right now from strong soaps to Lux. You'll see a definite improvement in just a few days. Budgeteers find Lux thrifty, too. Ounce for ounce, it washes up to twice as many dishes as any of ten other leading soaps tested. We can't make enough Lux to satisfy all our customers all the time, but we're spreading it as fairly as we can. So keep on asking for it. We return you now to William Keeley. Here's the last curtain call of 1946, as we bring our stars back to the footlights to receive our thanks. Pat O'Brien and Lynn Barry. You helped us end the old year in a blaze of glory. Thanks, Bill. It was great working with you again. You got back just in time, Pat. Yes, and I'm sure our audience would like to hear about your trip to England. That's the first time a command performance for the king and queen has included picture stars. That's right, Bill. Naturally, it was quite a thrill. What did you do personally, Pat? Well, I did a Burt Williams number, a poker game in Panama. Oh, I remember that number. I'm sure your audience enjoyed it. After the performance, didn't you travel quite a bit? What do you mean? I had to get out fast? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we slipped over to Ireland, saw the Abbey players. And, of course, you kissed the Blarney Stone. Think I really had to, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> no, Pat, I don't. After that, where'd you go, Pat? <laughs> well, we started a flight to Italy, got grounded in Switzerland, drove 550 miles across the Italian frontier for a private audience with His Holiness the Pope. Sounds like a highly eventful trip. What was the first thing you did when you got back? Well, one of the first was to catch Lynn Barry in her new RKO picture, Nocturne. Oh, that's sweet of you, Pat. 
And speaking of pictures, what are you presenting next week, Bill? Next Monday night, we start the new year off with a timely and highly provocative romantic drama. It's RKO's recent screen hit, Till the End of Time. And our cast is an excellent one, headed by lovely Lorraine Day and co-starring two of Hollywood's outstanding younger players. First, Bill Williams, who has soared to stardom in a series of fine roles. Second, that equally brilliant young actor, Robert Mitchum, both appearing as the ex-Marines who face the problems of adjustment and romance against the background of this turbulent era. A very moving and exciting play, Bill. And a great cast. We'll be listening. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good night and Happy New Year to you. As we usher in another year, I hardly need remind you that the world today is faced with grave responsibilities. It's time indeed to ring out the old, ring in the new. Ring in a new world order of cooperation, mutual respect, and peace. For the years ahead are years of great decision. Years that call for the larger heart, the kindlier hand. To ring out the thousand wars of old, ring in the thousand years of peace. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in wishing you the best of health and happiness in 1947. And we invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Lorraine Day, Robert Mitchum, and Bill Williams in Till the End of Time. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> During the holidays, you'll probably be doing extra cooking. Be sure to save every drop of used fat, grease from ham or bacon, or the drippings from turkey or roast goose. Save the fat in a tin can and turn it into your dealer. He'll pay you for every pound. Used fat is badly needed to supplement the short supply of fats and oils in this country. Remember, fats are needed not only for soaps, but for making automobiles, refrigerators, washing machines, and scores of other things you want. Pat O'Brien will next be seen in the RKO production, The Amazing Mr. Hammer. Heard in our cast tonight were Lester Matthews as Trabin, John McIntyre as Dr. Lowell, Herbert Butterfield as Barton, and Cliff Clark, Stanley Waxman, June Whitley, Eddie Marr, Norman Field, Dick Ryan, Charles Seal, Ed Emerson, Tyler McVeigh, and Franklin Parker. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. This program has come to you with the good wishes of the makers of Lux Flakes, the safe, gentle care recommended 33 to 1 by makers of nice washables. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Till the End of Time with Lorraine Day, Bill Williams, and Robert Mitchum. Spry. When you bake and fry, spry. for your cake and pie, spry. it's your shortening by Reliance Spry. Yes, it's pure all-vegetable spry for tender, flaky pastry, light, rich-flavored cakes, and crisp, golden, digestible fried foods. Reliance Spry. S-P-R-Y. Reliance Spry. S-P-R-Y. Be sure to listen in next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Till the End of Time with Lorraine Day, Bill Williams, and Robert Mitchum. And why not tune in a half hour earlier to hear Joan Davis over most of these stations? This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.